Hello, and welcome to How to Build a Beautiful Blog. I'm Zadik, and you learn to make this website from scratch. And these are interactive Scrimba screencasts, so you can actually pause me, go edit the code, make a change that you'd like to see, save it, and come back to it as you like. Now, if you haven't seen the Cosmos, definitely just stop what you're doing and go watch that. Don't worry, I'll wait. All right, so let's go back to our website. Now, one of the cool things is that it's responsive, which means that it can respond to some change. And in this case, it's responding to width. As the width changes, so can our website. And that's what allows us to have a mobile and a desktop version, all without having to build two separate websites. I don't know that I've seen this before, and if you have, that's really cool. This is a debugger, and it allows us to understand our website. So we'll use this and some other techniques as we build our site. Again, I'm Zadik, and if you have any questions or comments, even feedback, you can reach out to me on Twitter by clicking my face. Otherwise, you can follow me here, and without further ado, we are ready to begin. Welcome back. In this screencast, we'll cover four quick lessons that are essential for us to get started. So the first lesson is to recognize that all websites are, are really just trees. And to be even more clear than that, they're upside down trees. So take a look at the following. We have a tree with the root at the bottom instead of at the top. And it has two children elements, or call these branches. And these branches are our head and the body. The head is where we put our website's style and any metadata about our website, whereas our body is where we put the content of our website. So really, when we write HTML, what we're really doing is adding branches to one of these two different branches. So we're adding information to our tree. Okay, now next lesson, understand that these branches, or what we can call elements or tags in HTML, they can have up to three different appearances. Now this is a self-closing element. It neither has a value, nor does the value require to be closed. This is how we'll most commonly use HTML elements. Now finally, elements can have an optional attribute, and an attribute can have its own value. And going even further than that, elements can have multiple attributes, and attributes can have multiple values. Now, this is probably how we'd start writing any website. The difference from the code that I showed you here is that this would be a modern website, as we've added a few necessary tags. This element tells the browser that we want to use HTML5, and we don't want to omit this because by doing so, we let the browser decide for us which version of HTML to use. And in most cases, you really don't want to let the browser make too many decisions. We want to be explicit here, so you definitely want to include this. Now we have inside of our head tag, the meta car set, and the car set is acting as an attribute, whereas the UTF-8 is the value. And this tells the browser that our text is Unicode, which allows for all sorts of things, including Unicode emojis. Now we have a title element, and this titles our website to our browser. So if you look at the top of your window, you'll probably see titles, and this is how we assign a title. We have another meta tag, and we have multiple attributes. This basically just tells the browser how to render our website on mobile devices. Now last, we have a little bit of content and a little bit of style. So this is the text hello world, and we've wrapped it in a P4 paragraph. I'll just show you in the browser. We'll look like this. Now the reason that the text is not black is because we've used some CSS to style our paragraph. CSS is a combination of a selector, a property, and then value. What we've done is we've selected the P for paragraph element, property color, and then the value of green. And that's why we have a green text web page. Okay, now the final lesson, and we've talked about this in the first screencast, is responsive design, which is this bit of code here. I'll just show you what it is, and then I'll explain what it is. So as we resize our website, you'll note that the color changes. And this is possible because of responsive design. Our website can now respond to some event. And in this case, it's responding to the event of whether our website's width is at 8.5 inches or less. Now there are tons of events that you can use for what's called a media query. That's what this piece of code is. But the point is, is that this is how we can plug into our website and make some changes. And to be even more clear, take a look at the following. What we're actually doing is if this event is true, then we are overriding paragraph with the following color. So we're overriding CSS in some circumstance or event. And that is the essence of responsive design. All right, I'll see you in the next screencast. 
Welcome back. Now you'll note that our website now has three extra elements and these are importing CSS files. We don't have to use our style tag for everything. We can actually import CSS files using this syntax. So what we're doing is importing a font from Google Fonts and then I have two local files in the folder styles and then the two files reset and debug CSS which you'll see over here. So I mentioned it before, but this aesthetic is our debugger. It helps us understand our website. But what is a CSS reset? So by default, browsers make some decisions for us and it's kind of nice, but at the same time, it's pretty annoying. So what's happening is that browsers set their own properties. And this can be really frustrating because we don't really want to assume anything when we start our website, we want a blank slate. And CSS resets are one way to do that. So what we're doing is telling the body and all of the body's children, that's what the asterisk is for, all of the body's children, which in the last screencast would include the paragraph hello world, to apply the following properties universally. And this makes it much easier for us to start with a clean slate because we don't have to deal with any opinions or properties that are predefined for us. Now you can find other CSS resets online. I'm just going to create our own for this screencast. Now here, you might be wondering what is root? Well, if you remember, it's the root of our tree. So it's another way to say HTML. And we are defining a font for our entire website. Now you might be wondering, well, why do we not need an asterisk here? And that's because the font property actually inherits from its parent. So by defining just for the root element, all of its subsequent children elements will automatically inherit from it. This is an example of where we can set it once and it applies everywhere. Now, finally, the debugger that you see here, I'll show you how we achieve that. We are just setting three properties to all of the children of our body and then using a special important value, which I know looks ridiculous, so that we can apply CSS no matter what. If you remember back, our media query allowed us to override CSS in some circumstance. Well, the important would prohibit that from happening because it's asserting that under no circumstances can these properties and values be overridden. Using important in general is often a pretty bad practice, but for a debugger, it's a perfect use case. Now, if you wanted to disable the debugger, you could just as easily misspell it. And now it fails to load the file. And this is great because we don't need it anymore. And if we want it back, we can just fix it again. Or you could just as easily remove the whole line. All right, in the next screencast, we are ready to build our website. I'll see you there. Welcome back. Now in this screencast, we'll make the following design. This is our website on a mobile and a desktop device. And on the left, it's pretty straightforward. Whereas on the right, we have this extra column to the left and the right of our article. So let's go ahead and make that now. Start with an article element. And then we'll put the text article inside of it. Okay, here's our website and it looks pretty terrible. So let's add some things. I'm going to open up the article element and then we're going to say, I want you to be a grid. What we need is three columns. So we can template three columns by using the property grid template columns. And what we've done here is we've defined three columns. Each column is now occupying a third of the website's width. That's what the FR is doing. It's a fraction unit. So we take whatever the leftover width is and we divide it into thirds. Now our website doesn't really look like that. That's because the article has fallen into the first column. And so to fix that, we need to tell any of the article's children that I want you to fall between the second and the third column, which is from here to here. Now what's great about CSS Grid is that it's so easy, is that it's so easy to make changes. Take a look at what I mean. If I make this three over four, then that would refer to here to here and you'll see that that is now reflected. And again, if I wanted this to occupy the full width, I can just do one over four, because this would be one, two, three, and four. And what else is cool is that if I wanted this to be, instead of a third, 50%, I can just change that to two. Okay, so this looks better, but it's still not big enough. If we look back here, it really needs to be real wide. And what we can do is make this a fixed width of 8.5 inches. Okay, now if I open this up, you'll see that it looks that it looks right. And to make this look a bit better, we'll add a height. 
so that it occupies the available height. Now, we won't keep this permanently, it's just for this screencast. Now next is, if I view this on a mobile device, you'll note that we have all this extra space, and that's because of the fixed width here. So what we need to do is make this responsive. I can add min-max, which now means that this column is responsive. It'll go from 8.5 inches down to zero, and we don't have any extra space. This is really great. And you might be wondering, well, what happened to these guys? They're just gone. And that is that these are the remainder. If our website is less than 8.5 inches, we don't have room for these. And so they're just simply not displayed. All right. Now, finally, the last thing that we can do is see how the text is centered here? Well, we don't have that in our website. But one way we can do this is to add a utility class. This is a really fast and nice technique to add some CSS that may or may not be permanent. So right here, this would be permanent CSS. We have written it and we have the full intention of keeping it. Now, alternatively, we can use a utility class to temporarily, to temporarily add some CSS that will be very easy for us to remove later. I'll add an attribute that is a class that we can use to style. Now, this doesn't do anything yet. What we need to do is we need to create a class called debug center, and then our article's text will update. Okay, so I'll open up debug.css, and then here we'll add the following class. Classes are prefixed with the dot that you see. That's how we know that it's not an element like you see here. It's an attribute, or to be more specific, it's a class. We're going to use Flexbox, which is a fast way that we can position elements inside of a box. So what we want is to center it horizontally and vertically. This is how we center horizontally, and then now is vertically. All right, so we save that, and opening up our site, now, article is centered because we added the utility class, which is an attribute. And then we created a corresponding class to add some properties to this element, the paragraph. And now we can have multiple articles or what would be a blog post by simply copying and duplicating our article. Now, every article occupies our window's height, and you can see the next article after it. Cool. All right. Now we are ready to add some more complexity to our grid and I'll see you in the next screencast. Welcome back. This is our website. I've just removed the centering class and you'll note that the text is not really readable at the top left corner. So what we can do is add some room so that it can breathe. We'll add a padding to the top and the bottom as well as an extra column for the left and the right sides as compared to our previous design. Okay, so what we can do is first I'll add back our class. And then now we'll add a padding to the top and the bottom. You can see that that is now updated. Now you might be wondering, what is this zero for? And if we look at our website, our padding is only applied to the top and the bottom. There's no padding to the left or the right side. We could put a value here, and that would reflect the left and the right side of our article. But instead, we're going to use CSS Grid for this, because it's a lot more flexible going forward. Okay, so what we can do is we'll break up this 8.5 inch column into three columns. So the left and the right columns will act as the buffer between the left and the right walls of our website. What we've done is we've broken up the 8.5 inch column into three but the sum is still 8.5 inches. Okay, look at our website, it looks terrible. And what happened is, is that this line is no longer meaningful. We could update this to three over four, which would indicate from here to here, because one, two, three, four, five. because these are the actual positions that we would need. So three over four represents the content column. Okay, but instead, because that's kind of annoying, it's referred to this position as a value. And just like that, our website now understands where the start and the end of our content is.
So this is a much better solution than having to count every time we make a change. Okay, now the next thing is that when we make this a mobile device, you'll see that these columns are still too wide, and that's because they are fixed. Now, I can't actually use a min-max here because CSS wouldn't understand how to deal with multiple min-maxes in this way. But instead, we can use a media query to deal with this. So now, if our website is at 8.5 or less inches, we'll override the previous article's grid template columns with whatever we put here. So instead of a fixed width here, what we can use is a percent. And now you'll note that that column will resize with our website's width, and that's how we achieve the responsive design here. Okay, now this might look a bit weird to you. Why do we have a min-max if we have a media query? And we can just fix this real quick. Instead, what we can do is say, in this case, just be 7.5 inches. And then in this case, we can say be 90%. So that's a bit simpler on the eyes. Let's take a look. It's all good. All right, that's it for this screencast. I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back. In this screencast, we're going to focus on the content, starting with images. Okay, so you'll note that we have multiple width images, and what's going on is that these images, their widths, are actually the grids that we've defined. Okay, so I've moved the CSS into its own file called article.css, and we're linking to it here. And you'll note that we actually have up to four different sizes. So the first two look the same on a mobile device, but on a desktop device, they're actually different widths. Now, there are two more sizes. We can accommodate for the first three, but the fourth one, we actually need to change our grid. So all we need to do is add another column to the left and the right of our center column, and then make this one smaller. Okay, now our content has stayed the same because we use start and end, but we can represent a five inch image and still provide a margin to the left and the right. Okay, the next thing is that we need to update this because this is no longer true. So we can just take these proportions and then represent them as percents. All right, that was super easy. Now, whether we're on a mobile or a desktop device, we'll have a consistent grid that is also responsive. All right, so going to our index, you'll note that I've cleaned up the article because we don't need any of the other elements. And we'll start to add our image. So I'll show you in the browser, and this, <laughs> and this looks terrible. So we have a couple of things to fix. First is that we don't want our image to be greater or less than 100% of the available width. So I can say 100%. Now I don't need to say height because CSS will just resolve that for us. Going back to our web now, it's starting to look now it's starting to look better. So we're ready to add three more images and then give each image its own size. Now this won't actually do anything yet. So now we've defined four classes and it doesn't do anything yet. We need to actually add some rules. So what we've said is that any article marked with one of these classes for it to then begin on the fourth column and then end before the fifth. And so our website, now everything is the smallest size image. So what just happened is that the image is now rendering at five inches because it's starting at the fourth and before the fifth column. Now it's really easy for us to add support for multiple width images. And just like that, we have multiple width images, and they're all responsive because they're following our grid. That's really cool and really powerful. Now, the last thing that we want to do is to clean up our CSS. We want to be careful and not use really general rules like this one, where anywhere in our website, if we have an image, it would automatically adopt these properties. And that's a bit, and that's a and that's a bit too much. What we really want is that any image marked with a size class 
well, then it should have a width of 100%. So what we can do is just that. We'll only apply the following property if an image has one of these classes. And the reason that we don't need image here is because we'll reuse these classes somewhere else. And so this is the right balance of generality and specificity. All right, that's it for this screencast. I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back. In this screencast, we'll focus on the text of our website. And in the next screencast, the text will get a bit more appealing every time. So to start, I've moved some CSS from the previous screencast into its own file, and then we're linking to it here. You'll see me do this a lot in the next screencast. And now you'll note that our article now has all these new elements. So let's look at our website. It's a bit hard to read, and that's because we have the debugger turned on. It's a bit hard to read, so let's turn off the debugger. By misspelling the file, it no longer loads and inadvertently disables it. All right, so let's talk about these elements. We know what the P is. The P is for paragraph, and we have EM to emphasize some text. So looking here, this text is italicized. Now we also have a link here, and to link something, we use the A element, which is for anchor, and the attribute href now points to a website. So if I click Carl Sagan, it'll actually bring us to his Wikipedia page. Similarly, down here, I have a strong tag, and this will bold in text. Now, I also have multiple headlines, and the reason that we use different headlines and not the same one is because when we style our website, these headlines will have different styles, so it's better if they're different elements. So we have an H3 here, and here, instead of H3, I have time, and this is our article's timestamp. So we have text to represent when we post the article, and we have a daytime attribute to represent the same time, but this is in a standard format, so it's much easier for machines to read. Okay, and the last thing is that our article has an ID, and the ID allows us to not just link our website, but link a part of our website. So if I scroll just slightly, and I click here, it brings us to the article. You can see that here. This is what the ID can do for us. It's a way that we can make an article linkable. And so here, if I click the first line, anywhere in the first line, it will link to the start of the article. This is a really nice feature if you send someone a website and you want to link to some part of the website and not the whole website. Okay, that's really it for our elements. Now let's just add some visual breaks. So we'll say anywhere there's an H2 and a paragraph, a margin beneath it. And 2.4 REM is an expression that we can use to describe two lines. And so we see that here. Now, how do we know this? Well, looking at our reset, one line is 1.2, so we just use 2.4. But we need to be careful here, because if I said EM, it would scale proportionally to the font size of our H2 and our paragraph. If we always want two line heights to be the same height, then it's important that we use REM because 1.2 line heights is now based explicitly on 20 pixels and not whatever the size of the font is. So this will give us a consistent break. Now last is if I turn back the debugger, you'll note that we have all this extra room at the bottom. And that's because it's combining the padding and the margin. So what we really want is to only have a break after a paragraph, so long as it's not the last paragraph. So we can use some logic here. So what this does is we select any paragraph, so long as it's not the last one. So every paragraph except for this one would get a break. And you can see that in our website that that is now reflected. All right, that's it for this screencast. We're ready to move on to the next. Welcome back. Now in this screencast, we're gonna to start to style our text. So we're gonna go from this to this. So all we need to do is create a CSS rule for each of our text elements. I'll do that now.
All right, now each of our elements has its own rule. So now we'll change their size. All right, so this is a start. Now everything is the same size, so nothing has changed. But the point is that font is a really, really powerful property. So we can start here and then really add a lot. So let's say I want my h1 and my h2 to be slightly bigger. Now, if you remember, REM is referencing the 20 pixels here. Okay, so let's say I want our h1 and our h2 to be bigger. So I can make this 2 REM and we'll make this 1.5. Okay, now you can start to see our website take shape. And now I'll introduce you to font weight. So 400 is the default font weight, and it's doing nothing now. Where you saw the bold text before is a font weight of 700. So if a font supports it, you can have anywhere from 100 to 900 font weights. And if you look here, you can see that we've imported a few different font weights. So to match this, let's make some elements bold. So we'll make h1, time, and h3 bold. Oh, cool, it's looking better. Now, let's look a bit closer at the paragraphs. Here, there's a bit of height between them, and it looks good, it's, it's nice and readable. But if we go back to here, it's really compact. So we need to open this up a bit. Now, if you remember, if we go to our reset, we decided that the default line height should be 1.2, which is the same as 20 times 1.2, which would be 24 pixels. Now here, the only element that I want to have a slightly bigger height, and so 1.5 is a pretty readable line height. All right, that looks great. Okay, now looking back to here, our header and our link has an underline. So how can we achieve that? Well, if you remember, our header is a link, and so is Carl Sagan. So what we can do is tell our anchors to have a box shadow. That looks great. All right, so how do we do that? We use the property of box shadow, and then I used a special version of it, which is the inset version. Typically, a box shadow will be outside. This, however, is an inset box shadow. So we have inset here, and the numbers represent the x and the y axis. So our shadow is just going down. We don't need an x axis, so that's zero. Now, because we're using an inset shadow, we have a negative number, where normally you would just have a number like this. So this would be a normal shadow, it would fall below the text, but we want it to be inside the element. So we can use inset and then a negative number. And here we use em because we want the shadow to be proportional to the font size. And so if I use rem here, the shadow will always be the same height. If I want it to be proportional, this is why and where I would use an em. And then our shadow for now is just black. Now, what's cool is that our website is responsive, so we get this for free. But you might want your website to be slightly smaller or maybe even bigger if you're on a mobile device. And if you look closely, the text on the left is actually slightly smaller. It's really easy to do this. So let's look back at our reset. Everything in our website is based in one way or another off of 20 pixels. So what we can do is write a media query that will change the root's font size. So at 8.5 inches, we can tell the root that your font size is now, instead of 20 pixels, instead 18. And now the text changes. We can even take this a step further and have a second media query. But at 5 inches, we do 16 pixels. That's really cool. All right, that's it for this screencast. I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back. In this screencast, we're gonna add color to our text. So we'll go from here to here. Okay, so all we need to do is add some color. And you've seen this before. We did this in our debugger, but I didn't really explain it then, so I will now. However, there's different formats that you can use to represent colors. 
the format that I like is HSL, which is for hue, saturation, and luminance. Here, I'm using HSL-A, and the A is for alpha, that is, if we want to make our color transparent. So this is the H, S, L, and A. The H is for hue, and that's which color we're using. So 210 represents a blue. 100 is for the saturation of a color, and 100% would be a fully saturated color. If we want a grayish blue, you could do 50% instead. Now, L is for luminance, and if we want a white color, we would just put 100%. If we want black, we would put 0%. And if you want to see the color, I'd recommend starting with 50%, because that would show you what the color looks like. And then last is alpha, and that just makes it transparent like we said. So in our index, we're not going to use any alpha. Instead, we'll just use HSL. So we'll add a color property to each text element, and we know that we're going to use HSL. So let's start with black, and if you notice, the black that we have here, there's no actual black here. The darkest color that you see is not actually black, but dark gray. This is a nice technique that we can use because the text will look less harsh. So first, we'll make it black and then gray. All right, so this would be black, and you can see that here. Nothing has changed. But now, it's a slightly gray. And let's make the link color gray as well. Okay, that's a start. So now looking here, you can see that we have we have three colors. There's an underline and then the two purples for the time and the H3 elements. So let's start with the link. 55 is a good yellow and we can do 100% and let's make this pretty bright. All right, that is our link. Let's move on to the time and the H3. Let's make them both a purple for now. 250 is a nice purple value. We'll make it fully saturated and we'll make it pretty bright. All right, and let's just make the time a bit lighter. Nice, looks great. And that's really all there is to colors. And if we're on a mobile device, you can see that it scales too. This is really starting to look great. All right, that's it for this screencast. I'll see you in the next screencast. Hey, welcome back. In this screencast, we're going to do three things. So we'll add back our images, put a caption beneath them, and then at the bottom, we'll put social media buttons. Okay, so let's add an image between our paragraphs. Now, before we give this a size attribute, in HTML5, it's actually recommended that we wrap this in a figure element. And that's because we want to think generally here. If we weren't going to put an image, but maybe some other media type, it'd be better contained in a figure. All right, and now, instead of giving the image the size, we'll give the size to the figure. Looks terrible. Well, what happened? Let's look at our CSS. Actually, I think it'd be better that we rename this article figure. And I'll just update that here. All right, so the problem is, is that this rule is actually too specific. And I know that I was hammering on about this earlier but now we need to refactor it. So because we've changed the relationship where the images are not standalone, they're actually inside of a figure. So instead of this, let's change the order. Now anything marked with a size one class with an image will then get this property. Nice. And we can just as easily change the sizes. Oh, I forgot to add, forgot some sizes. All right, and let's take a look. We can do three, and we can do, and we can do four. Nice. All right, now we're ready for the figure's caption, and there's a convenient element for this. That's fig caption. And let's give it a paragraph. And I'm going to italicize Cosmos. Now, obviously, we need a break. And I thought that we'd get that for free. I mean, after all, we're using a P element, right? I thought P elements were supposed to get breaks. 
But the problem is, is that because we're using this logic, we're actually discriminating against this paragraph. So because we used last child, the last paragraph in the fig caption is this one, and that's why there's no break. So, so we'll just delete it. And it's not a problem anymore. When we introduce our social media buttons, there should be a break between them too. So we just don't need that anymore. All right, going back to our index, let's go ahead and center this and make it slightly lighter. So in our figure file, I'll add a fig caption. And if you remember, we already know how to center. So I'll just copy this. And we only care about centering it horizontally. We don't care about centering it vertically. So we can skip align items. It's centered. Let's just make it a bit lighter. And now we have a rule just for fig caption paragraphs. And let's make it pretty light. I'm a bit OCD, so I noticed this, and maybe you didn't, but the image actually has a slight gap beneath it, and maybe you wouldn't notice that just by looking at it, but this is exactly why we have a debugger. If you look closer now, you can see that there is a gap here. And where does it come from? Well, by default, images can go on the same line as text. We don't notice that, though, because this image is so big, there's no space for text. So we need to add a reset here. We need to change the default behavior. Okay, now it goes all the way up to the image. Now, technically, this would fix it, but it's not the best way to do it. This would be too general of a rule. What we can do is say, if it's a figure, its child needs to apply this property. And the block value specifically means that it blocks. It doesn't need to be on the same line as text. Therefore, we don't need a gap above or beneath the text. And now it's too close to the image. So we'll go back. And I'll just quickly add a margin. All right, the last step are social media buttons. And so we'll put them at the bottom. And I have the image here that we are importing from here, and I'll add empire. So like figure, I actually want to wrap this in a container. Now, I wouldn't use figure here, so instead I can use div. Div is just a generic container that you can use if there isn't a semantically meaningful one. All right, let's give it a class. And now we can style it. because the image is huge. All right, so we'll make two rules, one for the class and one for its contents. Let's fix the size. So we'll do width and height. I'm using an SVG, so I'm gonna add height just because I'll get some side effects if I don't. Looks good. These icons would never hug each other, so let's give them a padding. Nice. We've centered a few times, so it should be pretty familiar. We just tell the container that this is a flex box and that I just want to horizontally center it. But these, they don't do anything, so I need to make them links. To emulate that I have a link, I can just put empty links here because I don't have a link that I would link these to yet. And what's cool is we get that nice underline for free. If you didn't like that, you could make the underline a class and you would apply it where you'd want it rather than just have it apply everywhere. All right, that's it for this screencast. I'll see you in the next one, which is also the last one. Welcome back. This is the final screencast, and in it, we'll learn a very subtle trick to differentiate one article from another. We've just been working with one article, but realistically, we're going to have multiple articles, and we want to make it more clear where an article begins and ends. Right now, there is a slight change from the last screencast. I don't know that you can see it. I'll go ahead and I'll try to make it more obvious. At the top, we have a slight, a very slight gradient. 
and that can help us understand where an article begins and ends. Let me just demonstrate why we need it. Oh, by the way, I've just put the share CSS into its own file. And we don't need a style tag anymore, so I've just removed that. We have multiple articles. And to make them unique, I'll just make this the Cosmos 1 because we are living in a multiverse, and the Cosmos 2. Now, technically, there's infinite Cosmos, but we're not going to focus on that. All right, so here is our website, and we scroll, we scroll, and okay, so technically, an article is ending and beginning here, but I'd argue that it's not clear and it's not visible. I mean, yeah, we know that this is a headline, but still, it just bleeds into the next one. Now, the tint is only at the top of the article. It's not at the bottom. So as we reach the bottom of an article, it'll become really obvious where the next article begins. Let's go to our article, and I'll just rearrange that. Okay. The way to do this is to add a background. <laughs> okay, so too much. But the point is that so far, our article actually didn't have a background. It was just white by default. Let's go ahead and make it a gradient. Okay, I don't know if this is better or worse. What's happening is that our gradient is scaling all the way from the beginning to the end of the article. And it's definitely not ideal. So we can actually add another value. And now you can see pretty clearly that an article begins here, it ends here, and another one begins here. But this color is like really, really bright. So let's go ahead and fix that. We can use H cell and we can use 55 again with a 100% saturation. And finally, we'll use a really, really bright luminance. Nice. Nice. It's really subtle, but it's also a really nice hint. Now, if you're like me, you want this to be as precise as possible. How would we, for example, say that we want our linear gradient to stop at the bottom of here? If we're smart about it, we could say, oh, well, that's half an inch plus, uh, what was that, 40 pixels plus, was that 30 pixels, right? We could convert the inches to pixels and then and put it in there. And that's one way to do it, but I'll show you another. So what, we, so what we can do is add a value, right? This value indicates where the article should become fully white, one inch down. Well, when we shift the yellow an inch down too, it becomes a line because there's no area for there to be a gradient. It's just a hard line. And I got to admit that that looks pretty cool. So how would we get it to here? Well, as long as this value is bigger than this one, we're going to get a line instead of a gradient. And this will make it pretty easy to line everything up. Instead of using inches, we use REM so that as we resize, our gradient will actually resize as well. All right, that looks good. So all we need to do now is put this on the right side and then get rid of this one. And now it'll naturally fade to the bottom of here. everything will resize dynamically based on the root's font size. So you've done it. You've learned how to make a beautiful blog design from scratch. So again, I hope you really enjoyed this course. I had a lot of fun preparing it for you. If you had any questions or comments or, or even feedback for me, again, just reach out to me on Twitter at username Zadik. Otherwise, I hope you learned a lot. And I hope you can now create something that you couldn't before. Now go, now go watch Cosmos. If you really enjoyed this course, I really encourage you to share it with your friends or anyone that you think might benefit from this. Learning these technologies can be painful, and so try to help other people in the same way that this course might have helped you. All right, see ya.